Well, let's get started. Um, so we had a little scenario which some of you saw and some of you were in another workshop so you, you missed. But we, we had the, uh, the boys trapped in the bathroom as our introduction to crisis counselling. So there was a small child, well actually it turned out to be a little girl, um, who couldn't reach the bathroom door bolt and someone on the outside, a babysitter or a parent, who had to talk her through, get her to calm down, stop crying, be able to listen and come move a, move a little uh, stool and climb up and open the, the bathroom door. So that was just to illustrate that there's two components that are needed in crisis counselling. And one is to calm the person down so that they can take in information, so that they can think more clearly, so that they can make good decisions. And the other component is to give them the information, the pointers that they need to solve their problems um, and to have a bigger picture of the situation that they're in. Because people in crisis can get a real tunnel vision. They can only see one problem and maybe one solution and just can't see the rest. So you have to be the lateral thinker for them, but you have to do that gently. Um, so both, yes, both those components are needed. In the case of the child, he would not listen to instructions if you didn't comfort him and calm him, even if it is through the bathroom door. Or for you, it might be texting or messaging or something. You may not actually be with the person, but somehow you've got to calm them and comfort them so that they can take in the information and guidance. Um, just a little bit about the kind of framework that pregnancy counselling uses, we are using person-centred counselling. So it has lots of components, but to, to simplify it down, there's empathy, down on the bottom left there. Um, so you need to put yourself in that person's shoes. Um, it might be easy or difficult to identify with them. Um, you may not even really want to identify with their situation, but you need to have at least some kind of understanding of where they're at. You need to have congruence, that means being authentic yourself, not just play acting, not just pretending, but, but genuinely concerned and wanting their best interests. Um, yeah, and, and that will develop. I mean, you might be trying to help a person you've never met before, never talked to before, so give yourself time to build up that relationship and rapport. And the third thing is probably, to me, the most important one, and that's unconditional positive regard, which is a fancy way of saying that you, you really treat them with respect. This is just enlarging on that. Um, so you show respect for the person, even if you don't agree with their behaviour. And I think it's important to say that, because other people will often behave in a way that you think is downright silly or dangerous, reckless, um, or doesn't agree with your principles. But that's not the point, and you can't help them if you don't show respect. Um, then you need to assure them of confidentiality. Um, people won't open up if they don't think you're going to keep quiet about what they're sharing. And in the case of pregnancy counselling, it's pretty personal stuff. And if they're thinking of abortion, despite the efforts of the pro-choices, there is still a kind of shroud of shame and secrecy around that, particularly while the person's still making that decision. Um, they don't want everyone in the world to know, and there might be particular people that they don't want to have know that they are pregnant and thinking of an abortion. So you have to respect that, and I will explain. There are times when you can break confidentiality, but the general rule of thumb is what they share with you is just between the two of you. And if you can assure them of that, they're more likely to, to be more honest and open with you. Um, you need to acknowledge their difficulties, but express 
faith in them as a person. So if you gauge that they're quite a sensitive person, then compliment them on that, or they're creative, or they're intelligent, or they're, they're usually a very resourceful person, but maybe right now they're thinking, I don't know what to do. Um, so they need building up. They need um, you to express some, some faith that they'll get through that. And with you there with them, we can get through this. I remember going to visit um, a client who ended up attempting suicide and was in Te Ahu Mai um, psychiatric unit at um, Middlemore Hospital. And her first words were to me, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so stupid, I'm just, I'm just a writer. I don't know why you bother with me. I don't know why you bother to come and see me. And, and I said, no, I really believe in you. I, I, I see a lot of potential in you. You're intelligent. Um, you're very perceptive. Um, you're very creative. Um, and I said, I can see you coming through this and then helping other people in their difficulties. And... And she was really comforted by that because I, I, gen I said those things genuinely because I'd been helping her for several, I'm not sure at that stage, um, two or three months. So I'd, I'd seen a lot of her and got to know her quite a bit. Um, so I meant what I'd said and, and it was a great comfort to her. Um, yeah, so if you can express hope and faith in them at a time when they're writing themselves off, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, impart hope at a time when they might be feeling quite hopeless um, or, or too confused to actually see the way. They want to know which is the route through this. Um, but if anything, you want to slow down the decision-making. I was talking to somebody over um, the coffee break um, who said that one of the pitfalls of being very comforting and a good listener is that the person then, their emotions return to normal, but they might still be not good at making decisions and they feel so good they can do anything and they rush off into a bad decision. So, yeah, you want to impart hope, but you want to slow down their decision making. In, in pregnancy, you've got some quite tight time frames. If they're thinking about uh, the early medical abortion, so they, they've heard, you know, you can just take a tablet and that's the end of the pregnancy. But the time frame for that is up to, six, up to nine weeks. Now, they might have only found out they're pregnant, really confirmed it at seven or eight weeks, um, six, seven, eight weeks. So they've got quite a short time frame to make that decision. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want them to just do it overnight. They've got all the rest of their life to regret um, a wrong decision. So tell them, look, take as much time as you can to make this decision. Um, don't make it hastily. Get as much information as you can Look at the different options. Look at the pros and cons. And people used to say, I, I would hear other counsellors say, get them to make a list of pros and cons of abortion, carrying on the pregnancy, adoption. And I used to think that was a really dangerous thing to do because often if you just list the <laughs> pros and cons, everything would look like, oh, it's all weighted towards having... Um, a termination, you know, there isn't anything good about me carrying on with the pregnancy, there isn't anything good about a, adoption, that's painful. Um, but I think what you have to do is get them to think about the emotional side and what is the weight in some of those options. So something like a termination, it can look like a quick fix, a quick way out, but it's totally irreversible. Um, it doesn't leave you any options afterwards. If you at least continue the pregnancy, you still have options. Will you bring up that child? Will someone else bring them up? Um, so, um, and, and the, the emotional component, like the woman I gave an example of who had been brought up in, a, in the Catholic faith and thought that abortion was wrong, but in that situation of having come to New Zealand as a refugee and her husband 
um, relationship with husband was really bad. She was looking at termination, even though that was against her own principles. Um, so, yeah, I've lost the thread of what I was saying. Um, to not make, yeah, to, not, to, to look at the weight of the different options, the, the emotional and ethical weight. So it's not just a, it's not like deciding can you afford to take a holiday in Australia. It's, it's not something without emotional and ethical implications. So when they're deciding about um, a termination, you need to get them to think about yeah all those sort of implications and, and not rush the decision. Um, ask them about their religious, cultural, or personal beliefs concerning abortion, and and think. Ask them what were your thoughts and beliefs before you became pregnant, because right now they're seeing it as oh, it's marked exit. Um, but before then, perhaps it was really was anathema to them. So get them to respect, think about their cultural and religious context and, and ethics, and, and not just disregard those because of a very difficult situation. Encourage them to reach out to people who have been supportive in the past. Um, I remember one lady I went to see um, who was thinking about a termination um, young working woman didn't really want to um, she, she had problems with the relationship with the guy, she said um, he's got a drug problem we've tried living together I can't live with his drug use it's not working so we live separately but we still see each other and I've ended up pregnant to him um, but there's no future at the moment, in his current state, there's no future in our relationship. Um, I can't see him helping with this child, so I'm looking at you know, having a termination. But as I talked with her and I asked her, well, okay, you're, you're a young working woman and um, you don't want to be coming home and looking after a child all by yourself. Yeah, I understand that. What about other means of support? Who else is in your family or circle of friends? Um, and she started to talk about her mum, and she said, um, oh, and I, I, I broached the idea of adoption, that's right, um, and she said, well, actually, my mum took my older child, who was now six, and I didn't know about, um, she said, she might possibly bring up this one as well, because she often says, oh, it's a pity that so-and-so named the child... Um, is you know growing up on her own. It'd be nice if she had another child. So I said, well, it sounds like you need to talk to your mum. Would would she cope with having two? Um, it's only it's a, it's a thought, but it's worth you know worth a discussion. So she did. She went and talked to her mum. Told her she was pregnant, having another child. Problem solved. Her mother said, yeah, well, I'll look after that one as well. Um, so sometimes you just have to get them to think beyond everything hinging on themselves and themselves parenting on their own. Um, and the other thing is to get them to think long term. Um, a woman who's unexpectedly pregnant, unhappily pregnant, tends to think very short term. I'm, I'm feeling so sick. Um, I'm not sleeping well, I'm having trouble concentrating on my lectures. Um, I can't go on the rest of the year like this. They're, they're making assumptions um, that it's going to always be like it is now. Uh, or they're picturing a small baby who is so dependent, who wakes you day and night for feeds and changing and whatever. And they're not seeing beyond that to a child who lights up when they see mum and, and makes mum laugh um, and, and says funny things and, um, and draws in the community, the family. When you're pregnant, you don't even perhaps gauge that kind of community support. Once there's a child there, 
um, people come out of the woodwork. You meet other young parents. Uh, I remember meeting a, um, a businesswoman, career woman, uh, who was thinking, uh, how old was she? She was about, about 38. And she said, wasn't in our plan to have children. I'm pregnant, I'm thinking, well, it might be my last chance to have children, but I really can't picture myself having children. I'm, I'm, I like a stimulating life, I like challenges. And, and I said, hmm, parenting actually is a very high calling and it's full of challenges. You learn all the time. You have to be a step ahead. They are changing, they are growing. And, and what applied last week doesn't apply today. They can climb further and say more and out-argue you and whatever. I said, it is, you will use all of your intelligence, all of your cunning. Um, you can learn all the time with children. And you have the opportunity to shape a young life. What could be more important than meeting the emotional, physical, social needs of a child? Anyway, I, I, don't, I don't remember all the things I said, but I sold the idea that... Parenting is, you know, really a great career. Um, I said, yes, you might be able to go back into your career um, once the child is a little older. You don't have to be always a stay-at-home mum. But it, it is in itself a very challenging and fulfilling sort of role. And, um, and so she ended up carrying on with the pregnancy. Um, so sometimes you have to enlarge their vision, give them a picture of themselves in a few years' time. Whereas they're just thinking, pregnant, oh, big, hot, cumbersome, awkward, um, not able to do my modelling or my dancing or whatever it is that they've got into. Um, yes, there can be um, some of those things you do have to put on hold. Uh, it is difficult to to dance when you're six, seven, eight months pregnant. But those are temporary things. And, and people need sometimes a longer term perspective to see that they're not going to be seven months pregnant forever. It might seem like forever at the time, but it isn't. Um, now, I just want to touch on breaking confidentiality. There are a few times when you need to do that. Um, I very seldom had to do that in 25 years of counselling. Um, but you need to know that you have permission to do that. The, our Confidentiality and Privacy Act allows for certain situations, such as when the person is suicidal, when they are homicidal and making threats and other people can be in danger, when children or young persons are at risk, or if they're so mentally unwell that they really need assessment um, by a psychiatric team. So generally, um, and I've had clients who've been suicidal, um, and there's, there's a time to call in someone else. There's a time, mostly, if, if you've already built up trust with them, you say, you know, I think you need to see your psych team, or I think we need to go together somewhere, um, or you don't leave them alone. What, um, what we've been learning in, in workshops we've had on um, suicidal awareness is that problem solving does not avert a suicide. It is actually coming alongside them and listening to them that does. You mustn't rush, again, as I said in the previous workshop, you don't minimise how they're feeling, how they're seeing things right now. You have to come alongside them and say, is that right? Is that how it feels? Gosh. Um, like I, I ended up um, talking down a guy off the cliff edge at um, Coolangatta, Tweed Heads Coolangatta. There's a, there's a memorial there to ships and... Uh, sailors who died in the Second World War, and, and Australia lost a lot of ships, actually. Um, so they've got this semicircular, um, what would you call it, um, an area, a paved area, 
and they've got the names of ships and how many people went down with them. And then beyond that, there's this big drop down onto rocks. And we went to visit this place, my husband and I, and we walked past this, well, there were quite a lot of people there, um, and we walked past a guy who was up on a, uh, some sort of a step stool thing, right by a sign, and I thought, oh, he's fixing the sign or something. And then I had a good, got past, and I had a look back, and I had another look, and I thought, no, he's not. He had, he was sort of up on a step stool with his foot up on, right up on the ra safety railing, and I thought, that doesn't look too good. So I thought, it's odd that nobody else is questioning him. So I went back and I said, excuse me, sir, but um, what are you trying to do? And he said, doesn't matter, doesn't matter anymore. And I said, what doesn't matter? And he said, my life. And on he went, and I just kept him talking and um, found out he was feeling very alone and friendless. He'd come to that part of Australia with his family, then they'd moved on, and he'd stayed there because of a friend who was in hospital. Um, the friend had got through his bad patch, but then this guy had trouble making friends, and he was just feeling really worthless and really alone. Um, so I, I guess I used my counselling skills to tell him that his life was worth something. Um, there were things that, I said, I'm from New Zealand, I'm going back to New Zealand, um, but you are here and there are things that you can do here in Australia that I can't do. Um, there's a place for you here. And I won't go into the whole conversation, but um, if he had not, um, and he, walked, he, he got down off his step stool and I said, what are you going to do now? Because I thought, I don't want to turn my back and he's up there again. He said, I think I'll just go home. And I said, how did you get that stool here? He said, I brought it on the bus. So he had planned to bring that thing on the bus. Nobody's questioned, why have you got bringing a step stool on the bus? <laughs> like a kitchen step stool thing. Um, so he, he'd, he'd really thought about it. But on the other hand, he... He was standing there for quite a while, I think, and he hadn't jumped, so he really did want someone to talk him down. Um, and you may encounter people like that lady I described from Africa who didn't believe in abortion but thought that was the only thing she could do. But they really do want someone to talk them through an alternate pathway. So. Um, yeah, look for opportunities like that. But if somebody seems really intent on suicide and they have a plan and they have the means and you aren't with them and you can't stop them, you're at a distance, you really do need to find out where they are and, and get emergency people to them. Um, yeah, children at risk... Um, I've only encountered that with post-abortion people who are so angry that they're kind of taking it out on their children. Um, so I've had to yeah, gauge what's going on there and persevere with the, um, the counselling. Um, people who are mentally really unwell, um, there are what they call CAT teams, community assessment teams, who will come out, they're psychiatric nurses usually, I think, um, and they will do an assessment on someone who's suicidal or maybe out of touch with reality. Um, I, I once had to you know, get help for a young woman I'd followed, supported through her pregnancy, um, and she'd had the baby, um, but then she became really strange. She'd stopped taking her medications and, uh, yeah, my concern was that she wouldn't look after the baby properly. She was um, wandering around sort of unkempt and the, the, I don't know what else was going on, but she, she was really um, paranoid and thinking that there were helicopters up there w monitoring what she was doing and she couldn't go home because they were monitoring her telephone and those kind of things. And I thought... You know, she can't wander the streets with a small child. Um, and fortunately, I already knew which psychiatric team she was under, so I, um, I made a phone call 
and talked to them and I said, I think this lady um, needs an, an urgent assessment. Can I bring her in? And they said, yes, yes, we'll have someone here to talk to her. So because she, I built up that trust over time, she got in the car with me and brought the baby with her. Um, she had a whole lot of other stuff because she didn't want to go home. Um, so we just piled it all in the car and I took her straight to the psych team at Western Springs. Um, and the psychiatrist was, was really nice, actually. Um, but I had to keep saying to her, she, he'd asked a question and she'd look at me and say, shall I answer him? And I said, yes, yes, it's fine. He's, he really wants to help you. He's, he's a kind man. He wants to help you. So we ended up, she was admitted to hospital and, um, and I, ran, I knew her sister. I knew we had, had contact with her sister, so I contacted the sister and she took the child. Um, but that, that's rare, um, but you just need to be aware there are times when you can break the normal rules of confidentiality if, if someone's really in danger. Um, and there are courses you can go to if you want to. Um, learn more about that. So your, what you want to do, if, you, if you're trying to help someone who's unhappily pregnant, you need to explore her situation and her feelings, her thoughts. These are some of the things. You can start with something kind of safe and easy to talk about, like her physical health. How are you doing? Are, are you feeling sick or not? Are you sleeping okay? Um, if they're tired, um, it might pay for them to go see a midwife or a doctor if, if, they've, if they're not sure about carrying on with the pregnancy. They probably don't want to book in with a midwife, but they can go see a GP and it will still come under maternity care and, for instance, get their, their iron levels checked. If Some women um, tend to have low um, haemoglobin, other iron component. What am I trying to say? Anyway... <laughs> Other people who have medical training will know. Um, if they have low iron, that's going to make them very tired and they may need iron tablets, iron injections, iron infusions. There's all sorts of solutions for that. So just ask about their physical health. That's, that's quite easy for them to answer. Um, talk about what she's studying and why she's studying it. Um, talk about what her hopes and dreams are, what, what she would like to... Um, pursue in the future um, and probably the pregnancy is she sees it as at odds with that so it's important for you to know what are her goals and her hopes um, ask whether she's had any excitement about being pregnant don't assume someone is only unhappy about it people can have very mixed feelings so they might one day be thinking oh it's fantastic I'm going to have a baby this is going to be so intriguing. My very own baby. I wonder what he'll be like. Um, and then the next minute... It's that they have only one set of feelings, one attitude towards the pregnancy. They may have very mixed feelings. They may have good days and bad days. Um, so yeah, ask them what their what their feelings are about the pregnancy and what they are from day to day. Thank you. No um, we've covered thinking about abortion. Oh yeah, ask are they thinking about abortion? If they are, um, ask is this your first pregnancy? And if they say no and say, well, what happened in the first pregnancy? Um, so they may have had another pregnancy and they miscarried. They may have had another pregnancy and a, um, that child's been brought up by someone else. So that's a, a very good question to ask. Don't assume it is their first pregnancy, even if they are a student. Um, you don't know. They might have had a teen pregnancy while they were still at school. That is a really big thing, and that's going to colour what's happening now. Um, yeah. Ask them who they have told. Have they told the guy who they think they're pregnant to? If it's been a very transitory 
relationship, it was just a one night stand or something, um, then that's quite different to someone they're in a long term relationship with. Um, but that's really important. And particularly if they are still seeing that guy, um, they are still enamored of him, they're wanting to make that relationship work. I would warn people that abortion's a very negative experience, even putting aside all the ethics of it and so on. It, it's not a positive experience. It's a very negative one. And if a couple are pregnant and then she, with or without his approval, ends the life of that child, if she has any reactions to that termination later, He's associated with it. It doesn't help their relationship. Um, she's had something very painful happen, and it's, it's their child that they lost. She may, for instance, think, well, why didn't he stop me? Why, why wasn't he more enthusiastic? Why was he so passive? Why did he just say, oh, it's your decision? You do what you want. Um, I'll accept it. I'll just support you either way. That's quite common, but it doesn't help her especially afterwards when she's reacting and feeling terrible about it. So, um, whereas if she keeps a child, as I said in the other workshop, it doesn't need to be a tie to that guy. These days in New Zealand, you can get support to manage financially. It's not going to be easy. I'm not going to claim that. Um, but you can manage without the direct support of that guy. And, and some women need to think ahead. It doesn't mean that they'll never get married. It doesn't mean they'll never find a guy they really want to stay with who will accept not only them but their child. So um, talking about the relationship with that guy can be really important. If that's, if that's the thing that's pushing them towards abortion, then... Either you talk to them about it or get them to talk to someone who does know about relationships. But generally speaking, um, having an abortion is a negative experience and it doesn't help relationships. Um, and, and so that's why I put relationships right in the middle. Relationships not just with the guy but um, with her friends, um, with her family, uh, with the people that she looks to for support and, and affirmation, um, that's really important to talk about. Um, I'm just going to take this on. Um, so what you need to do, you've, you've begun the conversation, you've ex you've got, you're getting to know her, you're getting to know... And I'm, I'm talking all the time about the woman. Um, some of... Some of you guys might strike the opportunity to talk to a guy whose girlfriend is pregnant. Um, most of the same principles will apply, except that the guy doesn't get to say finally whether she keeps that babe, whether she terminates the pregnancy or carries on. Unfortunately, the guy can end up feeling quite frustrated and helpless because it is it does come down to being the woman's decision. Um, but sometimes it is the guy you end up talking to. And they are often, because they're one step removed, you might say, they're not so physically close to the baby, they're not quite so emotional about it, they are actually easier to talk to than the woman, even. So you can discuss what are her issues, what, what does she need support with, what is the thing that she's fearful of, what is... Why does she see pregnancy as an impossible path? Um, so, so take that opportunity. If you have, have the chance to talk to a guy whose girlfriend is pregnant and thinking of abortion, um, don't just think, well, end of the story. He is actually one of the most influential people in her life. But he mustn't come on too strong. And I've had to tell guys, calm down, back off a little bit, just go easy because... If he is really, uh, how shall I put it, if he's too strong about his opinion and what he thinks should happen, and um, <clears throat> you, you, you mustn't consider um, abortion and you've got to um, 
protect this baby or, or, or something along those lines, it can just polarise her. She's not feeling understood. Um, he's not acknowledging the difficulties for her. So he needs to say, what is it that's bugging you? What, what is it you're scared of? And really listen to her and, and address those things rather than um, just keep trying to sell his perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if that's your opportunity, then support the guy. And if she goes ahead and has a termination, then he's and against his wishes, that's going to be really hard for him, and he could be very angry um, and, and need a lot of support. Um, so you're, you're trying to do those two things. I talked about the two-handed approach of trying to comfort and encourage the person and, and calm them down and also give them the information they need and guidance. Um, sometimes the conversation will go so that they're just pouring everything out and you just have to do a lot of listening and, um, and you end up with there's a lot of issues here. Um, and you might have to come back to that simple question, what is worrying you the most? And just talk about one thing. You can't deal with six issues all at once. Talk about one, start there, and then maybe address the others. Um, or you may find she's reluctant to talk and you just, again, drip fed a little bit of information. And so, okay, you can just go with that. You can start to feed back um, some solutions to her problems. So you just play that by ear. Sometimes they have to let it all out and tell you the whole story first. And then you kind of do a plan. Um, and other times it's just a little bit at a time. And if you show understanding and helpfulness over one issue, they're likely to bring up the other thing. And there might be something they're almost too embarrassed to admit to um, some hidden issue. So, yeah, just, just deal with what comes up. So some of the issues that a pregnant student may face, I think we did cover quite a bit of that in the previous workshop, but I'll run through it again for anybody who's um, just joined us. So yeah, the relationship with the guy she's pregnant to, um, or sometimes they've been, they're in a long-term relationship with one person, but he's been, maybe they've been out of town on a, holiday or he's been out of town, they've had a little fling with someone else and they think they're pregnant to the other person, that can be a big um, problem. Uh, and yeah, we had someone recently saying, I'm not sure which guy I'm pregnant to, can I find out before the baby's born? Um, and so I answered, well, it's very invasive, it's very dangerous to be doing um, <laughs> tests before the baby's born. It is a lot simpler to wait till after they're born. Um, and yeah, you can have DNA testing done. Um, get, they get a sample from the baby or from the placenta, um, a sample from the, the guy you think you might be pregnant to, and a sample from the mother and they'll do the DNA matching and tell you, yeah, it's 99.9% .9 sure it is guy A, or no, we're pretty sure it's not that guy. So then they have to look at the other one. And, and after the baby is born, if, if that guy thinks that, yeah, if he thinks or is convinced that he is the father and he signs the birth certificate, then it's accepted he is the father. Um, particularly if he's, um, if, if, if they're married or they've been living together and he's financially supported her, um, you know, his, his name will be accepted to be on the birth certificate. That can still be challenged later on. Um, and there have been cases where, yeah, a guy has been supporting a child for years and then realises that there was another person in the picture at the time his girlfriend or wife got pregnant and he's been paying all this time child support for someone who's not his child. 
Um, so life can get quite complicated, but I think the important thing for you as a friend or as a, um, someone trying to support a pregnant person is yeah, what's her relationship to that guy um, and how is that affecting her decision making? And as I said before, sometimes they need to separate out what am I going to decide about the baby, what am I going to decide about the relationship, um, and don't let a bad relationship dictate what happens to the child. Um, current mental health problems. That can be quite serious if they're on medication um, for mental health problems. They may need to go see a, a doctor or their psychiatrist fairly quickly and just look at what meds they're on and what dosages um, because some of those things might not be very safe for the child. Um, same with diabetes and epilepsy. They can be tricky to, to manage through pregnancy, but, but they can. Um, there are specialists who will help with that. They may have fear of the family reaction, um, and I talked a little bit about that um, before. And, yeah, sometimes you actually have to get them out of the family situation. Um, but then sometimes they make assumptions that aren't correct. I had one young woman who, whose older sister had got pregnant while still at school, I think, quite young, teenager anyway, um, and the father kicked her out of home, and she had a really difficult time sort of living on the street for a while and eventually found a family to stay with. And this next, this younger sister was pregnant and she, yeah, still a teenager, still at school, and thinking, what is it going to be like for me? This is going to be like last straw. Um, my parents have already been through this with my older sister. What are they going to think if I'm like this as well? So we arranged for somewhere else for her to stay and eventually she did break the news to her parents and they took it really well, much better than she expected. It was almost as if they realised they'd overreacted the first time um, and they'd made life really hard for their daughter. Um, she hadn't forgiven them. They'd never really reconciled and they didn't want to lose their second daughter. So they actually took it in their stride much better. So, so young people who are pregnant can be in a panic and make assumptions about how their family's going to react that might not actually be right. Or they just need help and support to get to the end of the pregnancy. There's very few grandparents, I'll call them now, um, who don't want to take an interest in the child. Um, and I had one client um, who was estranged from her family. Um, she'd been quite a wild teenager, had a child, um, neglected the child, went off partying, and so the parents took over looking after that child and were really angry and disgusted at this daughter. Then some years later, she, got, she was older and a bit more mature, um, she was pregnant again, but her parents still wouldn't talk to her, wouldn't offer any support. Um, and she had physical problems because she'd been in a serious car accident. She had a plate in her pelvis, she had a plate in her neck, um, and as the pregnancy progressed, she found it really hard to, to walk very far. So I transported her a lot to her appointments to, um, to get yeah, to medical appointments or work and income and things like that. But eventually, I said, look, I'd like to go and talk to your parents. Can you tell me where they live? Give, give me their contact numbers. Um, and, and yeah, ask, tell them who I am and that I'm supporting you and I would just like to hear their side of the story. So we did that, and I ended up going to meet them and talk with them, and I said, look, she's really trying hard. She, she's trying to do her best to look after this, you know, look after herself and have a healthy baby. Um, she's accepted our support from pregnancy counselling. Um, she really wants to make a go, but she, she really fears losing this child. She wants to do it right this time. She, she doesn't want to neglect this child. She's, she's not partying all the time. Um, would you give her a chance? And, and the parents did an about turn and they said, okay, we'll give her a chance. Um, and, and that didn't happen actually until 
after the baby was born. Um, so I ended up being her support person through the birth. That was the first time I'd been in on a caesarean, so that was interesting. Um, but yeah, they they did they were reconciled, and and they ended up moving to another property where there was a little sleep out, and so the daughter and the baby were in the sleep out, and the parents were, yeah, just across the grass from her, and that was wonderful. So. Again, that was an example of someone who made the assumptions, I've got no support. There's never going to be any support. Um, this is going to be hard going as a single parent. But it, things don't stay the same. And you may be able to facilitate finding help, reconciling them to their family, whatever. Um, some have terrible morning sickness. It generally doesn't last. Um, there are a few women, unlucky people, who are sick for nine months, but that's not very common. Most, mostly it's in that first trimester, the first 12, 13 weeks, and then it eases up, and they, they feel really good through the middle months, and, and, and then it can be harder towards the end when they're getting big and heavy. Um, so just put that in perspective. Again, um, I had a client who was thinking about abortion because yeah, the boyfriend was not around um, and she was very sick and she had a small child of about two to care for. But when I went and sat and talked with her, um, she said, I have already been up to the abortion clinic once and they told me, um, just go home and tell yourself this is the best thing I can do for this child. And I said, but... That's, that's really telling you what to decide. A good counsellor should never tell you what to decide. It's your decision. Is it really what you want? She said, no, it isn't. I'd, I'd like to cope. I just don't know how I can cope. And I said, okay, so you need some help um, while you're sick. And so I made a roster of people from pregnancy counselling and anyone else I could rope in. And there are some helping agencies like Parent Aid and Parent Port in Auckland, um, just to help her to do a little bit of housework, spend a bit of time with the toddler so she could go put her feet up. Um, because the more tired you are, the worse the morning sickness can be. Um, and the less you eat, the worse it is, ironically. So somehow they've got to eat and drink in small amounts and, and take it easy and get through that time. And by the time she got to about 13 weeks, it eased up. and. She, and she was just so grateful that people had helped her and encouraged her. Um, and she ended up with her grandmother um, being her main support person. Um, but she needed, yeah, just some encouragement and practical help in the, in the early times when she was really sick. Um, for some people, it's the immigration thing. And I, I did touch on that last time. But just to recap, um, if you are not a resident, you are facing, um, you okay? Yep. Um, you can be facing your entire medical costs, which can be very high. Um, but there are people who will sponsor someone to cover those costs, um, the, the care before, through the birth and, and afterwards. Um, we have in the past had midwives who have said, look, I'll just do it. I'll just put the time in, support her. Um, and, and the woman's had a home birth so that there isn't hospital costs. Um, yeah, and that's, that's kept the costs down as well. Um, so again, you don't want people to, to think there is only one option. They've got to have a termination because they can't afford to give birth in New Zealand. The other option to get them to look at is going back to their own country of origin. Um, and for some people, um, I had someone from Fiji recently, and, and I suggested she look seriously at going back there where she would have much more personal support um, and, and lower costs. Um, but for other countries, like you wouldn't want to send someone back to China where abortion is just so accepted and commonplace. Um, you're better to encourage them to stay and get support here. 
Um, so, yeah, you just have to case by case deal with that. Um, yeah, and fear of postnatal depression, that that's, can be a hard one to deal with. Um, but if you can have things in place for them, there's, there's some wonderful support groups now, and there's, there's for instance, something called Mother's Helpers, um, which will... Um, they started, I think they started up here in the north, and they're gradually spreading through um, New Zealand, and they will do one-on-one -on -one counselling with someone, they will do group counselling, they will do online group support. The online support is free, and they give people strategies for coping with anxiety or depression during their pregnancy and, and preparing in case they have postnatal depression or coping with postnatal depression. They even have um, support for, for the guys. If, if um, the guy is feeling, I, I don't know what to do, you know, my partner or my wife has got postnatal depression, <laughs> she's struggling to look after the baby, you know, how do I cope with all this? Um, so it's really good to know about groups like that. How are we going for time? We've had an hour. Are we supposed to be stopping? I was going to... Yeah. Um, but are we supposed to stop this session here? Um, are they supposed to have an, a... Great. Yeah. Um, so... If people are fearful of postnatal depression, um, there's, there's many things that can help. Um, once the baby's born, they can have stronger meds than they could when they're pregnant. Um, they might have to consider about the breastfeeding, what's going to come through the milk. But, but generally speaking, they can have yeah, stronger meds. There's also, you know, there's, there's the emotional support. When, when you've had a baby, I mean, they, they talk about postnatal depression as, as kind of a, a medical thing, a, a physical, a hormonal thing, and that is part of it. But it's, there's also a lot of sort of situational things. Um, they're they're t really tired, and I think most of you know that when you're really tired, you're not at your brightest. Um, they tend to be housebound um, because of the needs of the baby. They're not going out. It's hard to get yourself out between feeds and sleep, baby sleeps and whatever. Um, they, they maybe have lost connection with a lot of the people that they were connected to through their work or their study. They've stopped that because they've had the birth, the birth had the baby. Um, so uh, I think there are components in postnatal dep depression that can be addressed quite apart from meds. Um, and and so you can get... Gather support around them which will alleviate that. So a person can, if you can talk to them about, uh, yeah, because I have struck people who have been looking seriously at having an abortion because they've had postnatal depression in the past and they just can't face going through that again. Um, but that shouldn't be an insurmountable thing because there are, yeah, means of support um, that you can have in place and have planned for for afterwards um, so that they don't despair and think, hmm, I've just got to avoid having another child. Yes? How much, how much, I mean, I'm not a doctor or anything, but how would we know that a child is, is affected by whatever the parent did around the time of conception? I mean, you, don't you, you don't know. I mean, so the fact um, that the mother is very worried about it right. is, there's no way that I can confirm that. Not, not early on. Um, most of the diagnostic things happen a bit later. Um, scans, they do scans a lot. Um, they tend to do one at around about uh, quite early, about nine weeks, because that's good for just... Like, babies grow at about the same rate in those early weeks, and you can pretty much size the baby and say, it's, therefore, it's that, that many weeks old. Then they diverge um, according to parents build and nutrition and whatever. Um, but the later scans, like they try to do an anatomy scan at 16 to 18 weeks. And that's very detailed. Um, they even look at the ventricles of the brain. They look at the chambers of the heart. They can see 
if the heart's working right. They check all the spine. Um, they check the limbs, all those kind of things. So if there's something really dramatically wrong with the child, they, ha they have shortened limbs like that thalidomide child we saw in, uh, whose talk was it? Not Brendan's, um, Callum's talk, I think. Um, uh, that will show up on the scan. Any, any very obvious um, heart defects, cleft palate they'll pick up, um, uh, and in Kefali, when the brain doesn't develop properly. So you can tell them, look, if there's something really, really badly wrong, it will be picked up with the anatomy scan probably um, towards 20 weeks. But then there's other things that are much more subtle. I mean, fetal alcohol syndrome does um, affect the face of a child. For instance, they have a longer upper lip, um, the eye spacing and a few things like that. But there's many, there's a, there's a whole spectrum of fetal alcohol effects from very, very affected to just a tiny bit. Is it even to do with the alcohol? And you can't say that they drank that much at that stage of pregnancy, therefore that's where the child will be on the fetal alcohol effects and continuum. So you can only say to them, look, we don't know, we can only hope for the best, at least wait until that anatomy scan. They do it deliberately at 16 to 18 weeks because it's before the 20 week mark when the law in New Zealand changes and it becomes much more difficult to have an abortion. Um, so the, the idea is that you'll find out if there's any big abnormality, you'll have a short period of time. It takes time for those, uh, oh, then you can have an amniocentesis if it's a genetic type thing, an inherited thing, um, or um, what do they call it, when it might not be an inherited thing, um, like cystic fibrosis is inherited and passed on by carriers, and they have to get it from both sides, but there's other things that have just happened during the formation of the egg or during the formation of the sperm. I don't know how many of you have done science and biology, but let's say something goes wrong, it's an unusual kind of cell division, and we have 46 chromosomes normally in all our cells, but when a woman makes an egg or a guy makes sperm cells, they only have half of those, randomly some half of them. Sometimes it, the, the, um, it doesn't go right, and they might get an extra chromosome. And it depends which chromosome it is, so some chromosomes, if you have an extra one of them, it's devastating and they won't live long. Uh, they won't even probably get to birth. Others, well, look at Down syndrome. Um, there's, yeah, they're quite functional people. Yes, they have, um, can have respiratory problems and, and they're mentally affected, but they can still be, yeah, quite um, wonderful members of society. So genetic things, um, can be picked up by amniocentesis around the middle of the pregnancy. Um, yeah, but you you can't yes you can't really tell a person early in pregnancy whether their baby's going to be normal or not. But for the mother in a situation to know, I won't say what's wrong, but if there's any abnormalities, to yeah. know before the day of the final abortion, what's, what I guess the law is at the moment. But you. You either give an option to, to still think about an abortion, or are you preparing the mother for what child she might have when the child is born? Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, if you get told and you know you still have an option, are you not also giving it again? Yes. Easier, I mean, I hope I never want to give you an easier way, but to say, like, hey, yeah. you still have an option of an abortion, or is it better to say, if the child gets born, you know, this is the thing what you can expect from your child. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you want to be as as positive as you can, and um, yeah, there's a lot of things that. 
that the experts can't give a clear answer to before the birth. For instance, with spina bifida, um, they can see on a scan, yes, there's a bulge, there's a malformation of the spinal cord, but they really don't know the, the full extent of that effect until after the, the child is born. Um, for instance, there was one client I had, um, and her, her baby had a, a bulge right up high, right just at the base of the neck. And generally speaking, um, with spina bifida, um, the lower down it is, then you can understand it's going to affect only the nerves from there down. But the higher up it is, the more of the body is going to be affected. So this woman came under tremendous pressure to have a termination. But she didn't believe in it. Um, so she stood her ground. In fact, she even got the midwife, because she, she had to come under specialists and whatever, hospital team, not just a private midwife. But she got her midwife to write across this, her, her file, does not want a termination, because that was her stance. But she was looking to us just for some moral support. Um, generally speaking, they're going to have all that kind of thing discussed and, and counselled at the hospital. It's hard to actually get a foot in to help. But occasionally someone will speak up and look for support outside of the hospital because, because the medical people feel it's, they seem to feel it's their responsibility to give you the worst case scenario so that you can't come back to them and say later, you didn't warn me that it could be this bad. So, so that's their kind of tack. But um, if, if a woman can withstand that and go to full term, then it's almost like they flip and they, they, will do, they, they will have in place at the time of birth everything that can be done for that child's survival and health. Um, and, and in the case of that one with the, the spina bifida that was quite high up, when she was born, um, I mean, they were going just by scans and they couldn't see the detail. Once she was born, um, they operated to repair this big bulge and they found there was actually very, very little, it wasn't, it was fluid rather than, it's mostly fluid rather than the actual spinal, um, the cord. The spinal cord was pretty intact. I mean, I don't know enough about anatomy to explain it to you. And it was really like the membrane had bulged and the fluid had bulged, but the spinal cord was actually intact. And a year later, that little girl was walking. And she was, you know, she, she, had, she was not incontinent. She, she didn't have the usual problems of a spinal bifid child. She was one of the mildest cases I've ever seen. Um, so she really just needed repair um, and had a scar. Um, but, yeah, they can't tell those things in early pregnancy. So all you can do is say, look, um, tell them about the difference between people who have a termination and people who don't. Um, and even if the child does have problems, the medical people will do everything they can to help that child live as normal a life as possible for as long as possible. Um, but it's, it's, that, it's that early time when the abortion is on offer that is the most difficult. Yeah.